I want to a little bit destroy that idea, actually. There's only the path. When it is direct, okay, very good. If you can take something which looks very direct, very good. But it's like when you are walking in the mountains, sometimes you just have to make a roundabout or something and follow a more indirect path to be able to continue on the more direct path to the top. You know? This is the same thing here. So, this discussion is, first of all, to be understood as a discussion about method and not about philosophy. You know? The truth that we are trying to reach stays the same whether you follow a direct path or an indirect path. You know? Only the method, okay, then we can talk about it. But very clearly there, in terms of method, there is no right and wrong when we compare different methods. Right and wrong only comes in the result. Does it bring you what you want or not? Like in what you were saying, you were feeling that whatever you are doing there now is really bringing you forward. Very good. No. And uh, you might have that feeling for some time, but there might also come another time when it's not so much working anymore and where maybe something which we could perceive as more indirect is needed. You know? And I don't want you to be too much stuck to this fixed idea of a direct path that you would then not be able to change your mind <laughs> and try something else. Too many people get stuck there. And that is because actually many teachers, they bring a kind of confusion about the path and the objective. They are talking about the objective, like in Advaita Vedanta, of course, this is the self, the cosmic consciousness, the truth, uh, which is always present in the silence and blah, blah, blah. You know, this whole story, I don't have to repeat it. But so the problem is there that they take this and say this is the absolute and only truth, which is totally correct. You know? And then they take something which is a method and they also present it as being the only way, the only absolute truth in a way linked to that, you know, concept of, of the self. And that is where the error comes. And I also understand how it comes because they are very enthusiastic about it. You know? So they want to um, convince people to give it as much a chance as possible. Now we can take the power of now of Eckhart Tolle. It's a very good example. You know? The power of now, we have talked about it in the series on the Mahavidyas, which is actually the power of Kali, the power of time. No? So, of course, if you can do that, if you can always be in the now, then for sure that is the best way. But that's a big if. <laughs> Because the moment you start thinking, you're already no longer in the now. Because thinking is always about what happened or what you are going to do. So, it has its limits. But still, he is very enthusiastic about it, wants to make everybody enthusiastic about it. And then, okay, whether that is him or his students, but then it seems like it's the only way. But that's just a matter of, you know, explaining things and making people do something, try something. And that is actually very important. I mean, uh, I very much respect people like Eckhart Tolle because they've, you know, brought about a huge movement. You know? How many hundreds of thousands of people are now living a little bit more in the now because of his teaching? You know? But if they have taken this very literally and try to use only that and discard anything else, 
then I'm afraid that many are now very frustrated. Because that power of now, it brings a lot, but it does not solve every problem. No? And, and there the main thing to understand is that our problem lies not principally in the conscious mind. We have to change our thinking, yes, but that is not going to solve everything. Because, you know, you've got to be able to hold on to that and you can't. All the good things we can think about this subject, they only last as long as we are involved with them. The moment we step back into life, other thoughts have to come. What to cook? <laughs> you know, very practical things even they come. So then uh, this gets lost. You know? So the real change that we want to bring is in our feeling. And that means in our subconscious mind. Because whatever we feel is always fed from the subconscious mind. And so, whichever direct method we try to follow is actually working always through the conscious mind. I mean, there are so many. There are so many and, and it's, it's definitely advisable to let's say, master at least one of these things, one of these more direct methods, whether it is listening to the sound of silence, whether it is holding still really in silence in the mind, whether it is observing the breath, whether it is observing the thoughts and everything, whichever one it is. Actually, in yogic tradition, it is advised to have one main practice which, let's say, you try to keep 24 hours a day. No? But that does not mean it's the only practice. But to have something like that, which brings you directly to silence, which brings you directly to a good feeling, no? so that whatever happens, whatever disturbance comes, whatever emotion comes which is not so agreeable, you immediately know what to do. And because you are so much focused on this one technique, let's say, you are quite good at it. So, whatever then that can do, it will do. But it will not solve everything. So, some things we have to work on in a different way. And uh, then <laughs> the problem is that everything comes into play. Because when we want to change that feeling, in a durable way, it means that many things we have to try to balance. And we don't have to balance them perfectly, but we have to balance them to some degree, so that then this one practice, this more direct method, is sufficient to keep us on the right track, to keep us feeling good, let's say. And uh, so then, yeah, as I said, everything comes into play. If you try to stay in the pure beingness, but your food is continuously creating lots of nervousness in your system, what's the point? Then you can feel, oh, I'm on the direct path, but, you know, if you have too many gases being created, if you're... Um, stomach is drawing all your energy away from you, <laughs> your method will be useless, no? So, balancing the food, other things to do with the body, the breathing. So many people I encounter who really have blockages in the breathing, especially the diaphragm. As long as that is not solved, Whichever direct method they use, it does not matter because it will only bring a fraction of what it could bring. Because their breath is simply not able to be deep enough and is continuously generating a feeling of stress. So, and then when it comes to the subconscious mind, that is where the most difficult things are. You know? Precisely because they are beyond our consciousness, they are mysterious and there is no like clear solution. 
No, if you have a problem in, in digestion, then okay, you get some help maybe, but that can be solved. No? Other problems in the body, in the, in the breath, in the senses also, they can be solved with clear you know, methods which are, which are there and which then require just some maintenance maybe afterwards. But the subconscious, it's a crazy place, you know. It has so many things that affect us from the past, whether from this life or past lives. And these things are not simple. The reptile brain is not simple. You know, people try all sorts of things. I can make a comparison here, for example, when it comes to People's love life, no? Because there, in a way, people try to do the same thing with their ideas on uh, what's it called polyamory, no? They feel, oh, this love between just two people is actually an illusion, that's actually not the truth, uh, because we should love everybody. So instead of having personal, like one on one relationships, they kind of feel, okay, I should be free to have relationships with whomever I want. Hmm? And, uh, yeah, that's a great idea, no? Until you, you do it. And then for some people it may actually work, because in their subconscious there's not so much resistance against it. But most people will there recognize the reptile brain as being extremely powerful, and even though they don't want to be jealous when, you know, their beloved plays with somebody else, they don't want to be jealous, they feel they have no reason to be jealous, they want to control it, they want to stay in the now, they want to be an observer, not a player, but still they can stop themselves of being very angry and upset and, and feeling very bad. Because this reptile brain, it has this kind of territorial <clears throat> thinking, which is not so easily subdued. You take time to tame that snake. No? That snake actually is not something which comes from our life or our past lives even. This comes from our animal nature. This is even much older than that, no? than those things which are more personal. This is very old. To conquer that, well, a lot is needed, and uh, this cannot be done with a finger snap. This cannot be done through the direct path, honestly. Although the direct path is part of the story, of course, as I explained. But this has to be worked on step by step progressively. No? Because that was a little bit your question. The difference between direct methods and more progressive methods. But so the main thing is not to think in terms of direct or progressive. Just simply think what works for me.